into the spring semester of the Edinburgh Research Center. Sunday. We call it Sunday. <clears throat> in the Monday part. <laughs> because I'll say something at the end about the rest of the schedule. It's pretty much set for the whole semester, and we'll maybe send it out um, so that people will know. In any case, it's a great pleasure to welcome a cross-town visitor. I know you've been anxious to hear from Doug Kellner ever since he appeared high on the list of professors to watch out for, uh, David Horowitz and, oh, yes. and company, uh, put a bullseye, I would say, over his yes. thing, if, if in fact they indulged in that graphic, uh, certainly was the idea. But uh, Doug Kellner, who, to confuse people, uh, is the Kneller professor. Uh, I'm sure that gets complicated uh, much of the time at UCLA and is a leading figure in what you might call Frankfurt School uh, third generation, fourth generation? Third generation. Third generation. And a leading uh, scholar of communication theory, postmodernism, and most recently, and that we will talk about today, we're focusing a lot on media spectacle. So I will turn the floor over to Doug. Thank you, Larry. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, coming out. And thanks uh, to Larry and the Annenberg School to invite me today to discuss my work on media spectacle. I'm going to argue today that media spectacle has become an organizing principle for politics in the US, for war, for news and information in the media, Journalism is organized around breaking news, media spectacles, and also has become a major uh, phenomenon of culture in general after the rise of the internet, where everyone can create a, a media spectacle. Now, usually I uh, would give as examples of media spectacles to go in depth Barack Obama, who was a master of media spectacle and won the election through the construction of a media spectacle that uh, sold the country uh, on him. I actually published that in uh, the International uh, Journal of Communication that uh, Larry and uh, Pastels and others here um, published. Um, and then the second example I used to give is Michael Jackson. It's an example of using media spectacle for fame and celebrity. He and Madonna were the first uh, masters of music video, of the music spectacle on MTV and uh, big concerts. Then he became a victim of media spectacle. And after his death, he is resurrected and living eternally like Elvis uh, in um, uh, media spectacle. Um, I think 60 Minutes on Sunday night had a, a clip on uh, dead celebrities and how they are uh, being promoted and uh, sold. But today, my example of a media spectacle is going to be the terrorist uh, bombing in uh, Arizona. The reason I'm uh, choosing that as an example is that I published a book called Guys and Guns and Mud on school shooting and domestic terrorism from the Oklahoma City bombing to the Virginia Tech massacre. And this uh, terrorist attack in Arizona fits into that uh, model uh, completely. So I'm going to use that to um, illustrate uh, my theory. First, though, I want to uh, tell you how I got into media spectacle and how I became, began researching this as a major topic of inquiry and written a series of uh, books on it. In the uh, 1990s, I published a book called Media Culture, where I argued that US culture and increasingly global culture was a media culture, that the media uh, stood at the center of uh, culture it became a major force of socialization, of political battles, 
and the ideology uh, became a major uh, player in the global economy, that uh, a media culture was the, the central culture in U.S. society. And I published part of the studies there of Reagan and uh, Rambo, of Beavis and Butthead, and youth uh, film of uh, Madonna, of uh, hip hop, rap, Spike Lee's films, etc. And just as I was finishing that book, I came to the conclusion that we were passing from the stage of media culture to one of media spectacle. This was the time of the O.J. Simpson trial, where 24-7 there was focus on the, the uh, murders and then the trial of uh, O.J. Simpson. It became a battleground for discussion about kind of gender and domestic violence, about class, about race, about police, about celebrity, and became sort of the center of US culture for um, some time. Right after that, there was the Clinton sex scandal that became a major um, media spectacle of the um, era. This was the same time uh, that you had the rise of globalization and the internet. So you had the spectacle of globalization and the anti-globalization movement of uh, Nike and McDonald's and global spectacles, Michael Jordan and uh, NBA uh, basketball. So I started working on a book on uh, media spectacle. Then there was the uh, 2000 election, uh, the hung election, which was another media spectacle. So I published a book on that uh, um, called uh, um, Grand Theft 2000. <laughs> uh, Grand Theft 2000 about media spectacle and a uh, stolen election. I was about to finish my book on media spectacle when 9-11 came. So I did a book on 9-11 uh, 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 the fair war on uh, the media spectacles of the Afghanistan and Iraq war as well as Al-Qaeda terrorist um, events. And I finally finished in 2003 and published this book on media spectacle that I've continued to uh, research. Now, the communication infrastructure, the political economy, of, if you wish, of media spectacle is the rise of cable and satellite uh, television networks, and particularly the rise of um, these new cable television networks that are 24 where you have CNN, you have Fox, you have MSNBC. And this created a 24-hour news cycle, plus other time of the uh, internet, which was also part of the infrastructure of the circulation and proliferation of uh, uh, media spectacle. So uh, since then, I've uh, argued that uh, political battles like presidential uh, election Wars are organized as media spectacle. Actually, I published a book in 1991 too, called The Persian Gulf TV War, which is about how the first Gulf War was orchestrated as a television uh, war by the first Bush administration, which is the same thing that Bush Jr. Cheney administration did. But they started off with shock and awe. They had saving private Jessica. Uh, they popped it off with tearing down Saddam's um, statue, which is the same thing that happened in the former Soviet Union uh, after the collapse of communism statues of Lenin and Stalin. So this was all orchestrated as a uh, media uh, spectacle. However, there was obviously with Iraq a reversal of the spectacle as there was with uh, the Clinton administration. So probably at uh, this point, um, I should talk about this difference in my theory and analysis of media spectacle from Guy Debord, by written on quite a bit, a French theorist who wrote a book called The Society of the Spectacle. For Guy Debord, the spectacle was the organizing principle of advanced capitalist society. It was a media society and a consumer society that was organized as a spectacle. Now, my difference from the board is he has a totalizing, globalizing theory of the society, of the spectacle, 
whereas I'm analyzing specific media spectacles like the 9 11 um, attacks, this Arizona terrorist attack, uh, specific <coughs> empirical studies of media spectacles. For the board, the spectacle is overpowering and established hegemony. The audience are groups. They're manipulated and actually uses the metaphor of a narcotic uh, for talking about the spectacle. Whereas I have a theory of the condestation of the spectacle, that it's a contested terrain. So the, the Clinton's uh, sex scandal appeared to be, was going to take out Bill Clinton. No president <laughs> ever survived you know, this kind of attack. But then Clinton fought back and uh, he survived. And so there was a reversal of the spectacle. The same thing with the Iraq war. At first, it looked like a great triumph for George W. Uh, Bush. But then you had the rise of an insurrection, a civil war, Abu Ghraib, and so there was a big contestation over the Iraq war, which actually helped Barack Obama get the Democratic nomination in the election because he's the only Democratic candidate that had critiqued the Iraq war from uh, uh, the beginning. Um, so um, I'm analyzing these specific media spectacles also, uh, the reward the theory is of uh, the society of the spectacle is denunciatory. He's attacking the society of the spectacle, which creates passive consumers and uh, uh, participants. Whereas, um, I'm again arguing it's a contested terrain, and that individuals can resist, critique, intervene in the uh, spectacle, and that it's much more of a uh, contested. Uh, terrain. Um, so I've been arguing that from um, the 1990s to the uh, present, you've had the rise of media spectacle as an organizing principle of politics, war, media, and culture. Now, I'm going to get into the uh, Arizona uh, shooting, but first some uh, background on how I got into domestic terrorism and uh, school shootings. In 2007, I was invited to lecture at uh, Virginia Tech. And I was talking uh, one day uh, to the person that had invited me. I was going to talk about media spectacle and Bush administration and Iraq and how political could I be in Blacksburg, you know, uh, Virginia, where Virginia uh, Tech was. And suddenly, um, I wasn't answering my emails. I clicked the New York Times website that there was a massacre, a, sh a school shooting at uh, Virginia Tech, and this became the media spectacle that took over the uh, media for uh, some uh, time. So, uh, as it turned out, I didn't go to uh, Virginia Tech because they canceled all events for the next uh, week or two. But I started uh, reflecting on and studying um, media spectacles, school shooting, and domestic terrorism. And I came to the conclusion that um, Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City uh, bombing, the Columbine High School uh, shooters, and subsequent, a whole series of subsequent uh, school uh, shooters, and uh, Cho Wee Sung, the Virginia Tech shooter, were all following these events, all followed the same uh, pattern where uh, you have a crisis of masculinity, you have male rage, you have a fetishized gun culture, and the individual uh, who carries out these acts uh, is attracted to guns and violence and carries out constructing a media spectacle uh, to resolve their personal crises and alienation or to carry out whatever craze agenda they think they're uh, carrying out. Now, it's very interesting that uh, Cho, the Virginia Tech shooter, was a would-be uh, film student, that he'd written uh, film scripts that were strongly rejected by his teachers as being too violent, you know, sick, et cetera. So um, he was discouraged in his writing in school. So he got into gun culture, buffed himself up, and actually constructed a media spectacle where he was the producer and the star the director, etc. And the, de the day after uh, the Virginia Tech uh, massacre, NBC received a dossier 
where there was uh, videos that Cho had made, a ranting uh, manifesto, pictures of him that had like taxi driver uh, pictures, images from a John Wu uh, film. It turns out he was really into John Wu and uh, Asian extreme and sort of orchestrated this, his media spectacle to the script of uh, the John Wu uh, film. I then um, looked, went back and uh, read all the books on uh, Timothy McVeigh. And it turns out that uh, he served in the Gulf, the first uh, Gulf War. He wanted to join special forces, but he flunked. He failed to get into special uh, forces. It's interesting that the Arizona shooter was also tried to get in the Army and wasn't able uh, 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 to uh, do it. McVeigh then got very heavy into right-wing uh, gun culture and created the Oklahoma City bombing that was the biggest terrorist event in U.S. Uh, society as a media spectacle to sort of strike um, against the government. So in some sense, this uh, Arizona Act of Domestic Terrorism is following that same model. By the way, there's been about, uh, since 2008, scores of attacks on uh, Democratic Congress people, um, Representative Guilford's had had her office bombed during the um, health care uh, debate. Ten other Democratic um, Congresses' offices were blown up in, uh, at the same time. There was um, a shooting up of the Arkansas Democratic headquarters in 2008 where a couple people uh, were killed. Uh, there was a shooter shooting at the Pentagon, another one in Las Vegas going after federal judges, et cetera. So you really have this pattern of guys and uh, guns <coughs> and not, and of individuals using media spectacle to resolve their crises of uh, masculinity and to become celebrities. There's a lot of copycat going on, particularly in the area of school shootings, where there's been scores of school shootings uh, since uh, Columbine. <coughs> and it's also happened in Finland, in Germany, in China, throughout the world. Last year, I went to a conference in Helsinki on uh, school uh, shootings. And it all follows the same pattern. So people get into this internet uh, subcultures. Uh, they find you know, solace and, and kinship, like-minded uh, people there. They absolutely idolize the Columbine shooters. They become uh, models, you know, of emulation, um, et cetera. And a lot of them are into, like, this hard uh, masculinity, et cetera. By the way, speaking of uh, media, the other thing I found out about uh, Timothy uh, McVeigh is in an interview, one of the books on him, he saw himself as a Jedi warrior that just as the Jedi warriors in Star Wars blew up the Death Star to attack the evil empire, even though uh, innocent civilians you know, were killed, it was justified because it was a battle against the evil uh, uh, empire. Um, most of these shooters uh, loved uh, Red uh, Dawn. This was one of their favorite movies that had uh, uh, a guerrilla band of teenagers uh, attacking a communist invasion that took place in a Colorado <coughs> small town, uh, which again, uh, the director of this, John Milius, is a fetish and celebrant of guns and hard tough guy uh, masculinity. So we have a very uh, similar uh, phenomena of um, crisis of masculinity, male rage, getting into gun culture, getting into some extremist culture, and then uh, carrying out these uh, shootings. By the way, I want to avoid single causal analyses and models. I don't want to, I have a multi-causal, multi-dimensional perspectival uh, analysis. At the time of uh, Columbine, some people blamed it on music and goth culture and Marilyn Manson, which uh, Marilyn Manson, as you remember from Michael Moore's uh, bowling uh, for Columbine, uh, clearly, um, you know, critiqued uh, uh, Lieberman on it. Others claimed it was the internet. They got into Nazi science and blamed it on the uh, internet. 
Others blamed it on video games, that they were gamers, and so it was blamed on uh, uh, video games. Others blamed it on liberal families and upbringing, that their kids allowed them to amass you know, all these weapons, didn't supervise uh, their uh, behavior. The Scientologists blamed it on uh, pharmaceutical <coughs> drugs. So all of these different um, group, interest groups that have you know, agendas and knives to cut, whenever these um, events happen, you know, they have this cause, one causal uh, fact that they blame, which is mostly, he's crazy. These are just mad men, you know, beginning and uh, uh, story, uh, et cetera. Now, obviously, uh, a lot of these uh, school shooters and domestic terrorists can be probably labeled as schizophrenic or, you know, mentally disturbed in uh, some way or another. Which, by the way, raises the question of how do they get guns so well? Uh, uh, Cho had actually been involved um, in the mental health uh, system, and they should have gotten, you know, data, um, et cetera. It's not clear to what extent uh, the Arizona shooter, he, um, again, he tried to get into the Army, was rejected. He was kicked out of community uh, college because of mental health issues. And they told him that after, uh, that if he got a, a documentation that he was mentally sound, he could, you know, come back uh, to uh, school. But somehow these uh, people just slipped through the system. They are able to buy guns, uh, either at local stores through the internet, uh, at gun shows without any checks. So we really have a uh, out of uh, control um, uh, gun culture. Now, the other factors um, that I would bring into analysis, well, I think I'm going to speak for about 10 or 15 more minutes, and then we'll uh, open up for uh, discussion. Um, The other uh, important factor in analyzing these school shootings, doing a uh, multi-causal uh, analysis, is analyzing the uh, specific culture in which these different terrorists or school shooters live. And in this case, we're talking about Arizona. that has one of the most uh, virulent you know, right-wing, uh, Tea Party, extremist, <coughs> talk radio, internet um, uh, culture uh, in uh, the country. And the last two or three days, I've been doing nothing but watching TV and going to these websites, uh, researching this. And I found out some astonishing things that uh, <coughs> Representative uh, Gabriela Giffords, who was the target of this uh, shooting, her opponent in the congressional election uh, had a rally during the election and a gun shooting site and said, we're going to target um, uh, Giffords, we're going to uh, take her um, out. Um, a year before, some guy at one of her um, meet and greet sessions had a gun that fell out you know, of uh, his shoulder pistol. Uh, I mentioned how her congressional office uh, was, um, was attacked. Uh, after her health care uh, vote. Uh, Sarah Palin, uh, infamously, we know she has this uh, <coughs> website that says, reload, don't retreat, and then has a map of uh, the congressional uh, candidates are going to take out, of which uh, Gabriella Giffords was uh, one. So in this uh, overheated uh, political um, environment, you had a lot of hate speech, of vitriolic um, rhetoric, uh, of uh, extremism. By the way, the sheriff um, is now a new cultural hero, but also a uh, flashpoint. Uh, the day of the shooting, the sheriff had a news conference, and he was a close personal friend of both the judge and uh, the congresswoman that was uh, shot. And he said that Arizona has now become a mecca of uh, bigotry and intolerance, tolerance and vitriolic uh, language. And uh, did an equally uh, uh, critical uh, 
analysis of the political culture of Arizona the next uh, day, which, according to articles in the New York Times uh, and Washington Post, has made him a cultural hero for some, that he's saying what no one else will say and what needs to be said, and it's made him a target for uh, Fox News and the uh, right wing that were saying that he should uh, resign, there should be a gag order, a restraining order that uh, sheriffs aren't supposed to get involved in uh, politics. So uh, we have very much of a contested terrain in terms of this uh, terrorist shooting with every political group you know, going in and manipulating and using it to uh, promote their agenda. So I want to just uh, conclude with, in this uh, situation, uh, what can, what can be done? I'm not going to go into any uh, detail about uh, reforming gun laws, but uh, I was actually happy that for the first time in years I saw a serious debate about gun laws and the restriction of uh, the semi-automatic uh, handguns with these, you know, uh, clips to hold 30 um, uh, shots, uh, which is exactly what uh, the Arizona uh, shooter uh, used. He had a Glock um, uh, pistol, etc. I, I don't see, and these, by the way, these assault rifles and guns were banned during the Clinton administration, but then during the Bush-Cheney, this uh, ban came back. Uh, I don't know if we want to let everyone be able to buy guns at gun shows or, you know, on the internet or without, you know, more serious uh, checks. So we need to have at least a uh, debate about uh, gun laws. Um, secondly, we need to look at the role of the media in promoting hard masculinities as a, you know, model for uh, men and violence as the solution to social problems. Um, on, I think it was uh, uh, Saturday night, after spending all day, you know, watching uh, the TV reports and the internet, uh, I saw this um, <coughs> movie by Sylvester Stallone called The Expendables. I should note that I uh, published a book called Cinema Wars on the politics and ideology of film in the Bush Cheney era where I argue that a lot of uh, movies really critique U.S. militarism and hard masculinity, that this really is a contested terrain over gender, race, sexuality in uh, Hollywood film. But this Stallone film really, you know, is sort of the image of hard masculinity uh, with all these tough guy heroes from every movie, including Arnold and uh, Bruce Willis in um, cameo uh, roles, etc. Uh, and violence is again just celebrated throughout this uh, movie. So we really need to have uh, critiques of representations of masculinity and violence. Actually, that same Saturday night after the Stallone film, I saw a documentary on Tennessee Williams and the South, uh, the completely different image of masculinity, Tennessee Williams. Here was this cool, urbane, witty, good humored, very creative uh, guy who represents, again, a tremendously different image <coughs> of masculinity. And Barack Obama, I think, also is the first president that didn't you know, take this hard masculinity <coughs> in his campaigning. John Kerry went out and you know shot some rabbits and then held them up for the camera. Uh, George W. Bush bought a ranch in uh, Texas. He suddenly got a cowboy accent, wore cowboy clothes, etc. So he could come off as, you know, a tough guy, a uh, masculinist. So Obama is really the, the no drama. Obama is the only one that has adopted a, um, uh, an alternative uh, masculinity. And then thirdly, following George Gerdner and Gerdner Gross uh, et al., we need to uh, do critiques of the media to see to what extent media is promoting violence in both quantitative and uh, qualitative uh, uh, ways. So I, to conclude, I would argue that in this era of media spectacle, where all um, political debates take place through the media and in the form of spectacle, where news and information is organized uh, 
according to breaking news and media uh, uh, spectacles, that media and communication scholars have all the more responsibility to really analyze, critique the media, and to uh, participate in these uh, debates over uh, politics and uh, culture in the U.S. So thank you for your attention, and we'll go to questions. One is in talking about the Virginia Tech shooter, obviously, uh, taxi driver comes up yet again. Right. And we know from the Hinckley Lennon uh, assassination uh, that, that media has been uh, a, a subject of great dis discourse over uh, violence in our society. Um, how do you think the internet has uh, accentuated, propelled, heightened that factor? And the second question has to do with the fact of this emasculation. Uh, syndrome of, uh, of these with these shooters, and contrast that with the current debate in the blogosphere about the fact that one of the heroes from from Arizona was a openly gay intern who uh, is credited with having helped save the congresswoman's oh, life. Okay. And the debate now is: is that relevant? Should that even be discussed that he was gay? <coughs> and yet, just a month before, the senator from Arizona was saying that gay people couldn't even serve in the military. Right. So I just there's I mean, two everything's relevant, I think, in terms of uh, uh, discussion, uh, in which homophobes attack gays in uh, the media. So I, I think this is a really relevant uh, issue to uh, discuss. Tennessee Williams was gay. Allen Ginsberg, who really, actually, I saw Howell also in the last week, which is the movie about Allen Ginsberg uh, program. Uh, um, these guys were really out in the 1950s at a time where just people weren't out and got gay uh, culture into the uh, mainstream. And it was hard to attack. We were just going to attack Tennessee Williams, but the grossest, you know, cultural Philistine and uh, you know, homophobes, et cetera. And Allen Ginsberg too, just so lovable and such a great, uh, you know, uh, poet. Now the internet. Uh, actually changed everything from the moment, you know, in the 1990s that it uh, developed. And there's tremendous positives and big negatives in the internet. Uh, I, it's a big mistake, again, to demonize, you know, anything. The internet is, uh, you know, like video games or films, etc. Because it's always a very much of a contested terrain. So on one hand, the internet has allowed social movements, including gay, lesbian, feminist, environmental, et cetera, to get their views out there that were invisible in the uh, mainstream uh, media. In the new era of Twitter, you know, YouTube, blogging, everyone can participate in political and cultural debates, create their own spectacles, uh, YouTube, et cetera. So there's big positives in the internet. But on the other hand, there's rise of really vitriolic, uh, you know, hate. Uh, sites, et cetera, that have very strong and seductive uh, effects. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you had any reflection on the element that time plays in the idea of spectacle, particularly as it relates to speculation and, and kind of backpedaling. Because um, with this Arizona example, um, you know, immediately in Twitter, really without any sort of evidence, people were saying RIP, you know, assassination, not attempt, but, but assassination. Right. And, and people in, in the hospital room with her were getting these feeds and were kind of this, this conflict um, of she's not dead and yet right, we're getting right, overwhelmed right. by, and the fact that with the neurological, you know, aspect to it that they could not know for months what's going to happen to her. So what, but yet in this wanting to make a martyr, Right. Out of her. So the element of time plays in, in spectacle. Uh, crucial. For one thing, it's one of the criteria <coughs> what constitutes a media spectacle. It's an event uh, that takes place over a period of time that becomes the dominant event of its era, like 9-11 did. You know, for, uh, <coughs> the school shootings for at least a couple weeks, sometimes <coughs> months afterwards, became sort of the center of media. Uh, the other time issue is that uh, it always takes time to establish the facts, you know, of what really happened. So that with Oklahoma City bombing, there was a swarthy Middle Eastern male that was accused of it. So there was all these anti-Arab 
you know, tirades the first days of the Oklahoma City bombing, whereas McVeigh was exactly, you know, on the other side, you know, white male shooter. And I've noted on this Arizona, there's a lot of missing, you mentioned, you know, the victim that she was instantly pronounced dead, which, you know, wasn't uh, the case. So it's probably going to take a long time to get some of the facts of what motivated the uh, shooter, um, of uh, what the situation, what the facts are. Of it, and also how it's going to play out. What effect it will have, we don't know. Will it change gun laws? Will it just embolden the right? Time will tell. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for your talk. I'm, I'm sorry that we had another media spectacle that you could use as <coughs> such a you know, compelling example. Um, I'm wondering about if you could comment a little bit about um, some of the complexities in the definition of hard masculinity. Um, and specifically, I'm wondering about how um, racialized discourses play into this. I mean, certainly not all school shootings are done by white ma men, but the majority of them are. Um, Virginia Tech was a kind of anomaly because of this. Um, this, this shooting in Arizona, um, regardless of motive or anything else, has a context of anti-immigration vitriol, like you said. And, and I'm thinking, too, that media spectacle um, media spectacles that are uh, kind of particularly racialized that aren't that don't involve that kind of violence, but involve the kind of patholi patho pathologized black masculinity, like say Michael Vick, right? Um, and you know Tucker Carlson <coughs> saying that we should execute him and right. that kind of thing, and then taking it back, whatever. But um, you know uh, that that there's that there's you know kind of nuances in this definition of hard masculinity. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Uh, absolutely, you have to do the context and the definition for each one of these people in a specific uh, context. Generally speaking, these uh, school shootings, domestic terrorism, they're about all of these things. They're about uh, certainly gender and masculinity, but also uh, sexuality, uh, race, uh, <coughs> class. And um, in my analysis, it's curious that almost all of what you would call the terrorist acts of the school shootings are not shooters of color. But again, as you pointed out, the Cho was an anomaly where his alienation came from him being a, a Korean American and being alienated from the uh, you know highly Christian and white bred uh, Virginia Tech uh, culture and being attracted by these specific Asian extreme uh, uh, films. So hard masculinity basically is Stallone and Arnold. It's, it's these really tough guys. Uh, Susan Jeffords did a book on uh, hard bodies, I was um, Reagan and Rambo, you know, for instance. See, these are the, like in the Expendables, the guy's too hard and too tough to go away with the Latino woman at the end. You know, they, they, Rambo never gets the girl, etc. So this, this is part of this sort of repressed tough guy, hard body, uh, masculinity. And so all these shooters, this is what they aspire to or dream to approximate, but they, they don't really, you know, incarnate that fantasy, et cetera. And what I'm arguing that we need different, you know, images or visions of, of masculinity as well as uh, <coughs> for decades has been all these discussions about representations of women in the media, but you know, men, masculinity, is also a social construct and needs to be discussed in the same seriousness. Yeah, so if, uh, if Du Bois' idea of the spectacle is a uh, sort of opiate, which blankets the masses and lulls them to sleep, and what we're talking about now is a participatory spectacle where right. people are tweeting, recirculating, right. and spreading these media texts themselves, I guess I'm just curious to hear how, how you think about that. Is it, is it still spectacle when it's participatory? Do we need some other terms? Um, or is it just that what people were always doing uh, you know, in the living room uh, verbally has now become uh, obvious? When I'm using the term uh, media spectacle, I'm talking about the big phenomenon of this Arizona uh, terrorist bombing. <coughs> Part of the spectacle is you know, the Twitter, et cetera, which a lot of this gets into the New York Times or LA Times or goes on Fox or MSNBC. So uh, I think in, it is an era of participation in the construction of the uh, spectacle. 
that anyone that makes a YouTube that really hits it is going to, you know, circulate it, et cetera. So, yeah. Uh, why, why then do you resist using the term hegemony? Because I, I think you make a convincing case that right. the media violence has hegemonic uh, uh, representation. And uh, uh, what is the alternate method you see the hegemonic analysis, given the cracks of hegemony can be contested spaces? Exactly. What, what, what uh, uh, is the uh, virtues of the empirical method that, that doesn't work from the assumption of hegemony? In I, actually, I do operate from the assumption of hegemony in exactly the Gramscian analysis and exactly how you characterize it as a contested terrain. So if you look at hegemony in the United States from the 60s to the uh, present, you'll see it goes back and forth, left and right, that there's these condestations, which in the age of the internet and cable television are all the more polarized. So there's a battle for political hegemony that takes place through media spectacle. But also in terms of race, since the civil rights movement, there has been a battle for hegemony between a civil rights, uh, uh, liberal, progressive agenda, and you know, a racist agenda uh, on the issue of gender, you know, contested terrain, sexuality. There, at one point, it was a white male, heterosexual, you know, straight hegemony, et cetera, <coughs> all of which still might, you know, be dominant to some extent. But the hegemony has been contested, et cetera. So I definitely use the term hegemony, but I see it as contested, shifting, changing, uh, et cetera. But <clears throat> when you cited the uh, sort of analysis of the role of the media, when, when George and I were talking about this stuff back in the 70s, uh, the, the context there specifically by media violence, was that it cultivates a sense of threat and danger. Right. And in, in some ways, therefore, uh, more of an interest in reliance on, um, on the protection of the authorities. Right. So more support for uh, police, more support for the military, also more support for doing away with you know, uh, legalistic interpretations that favor criminals. You know, that right. sense of that. It seems to me that what's changed in the interval is the explosion of the Second Amendment uh, position, which now, I think, quite frequently <coughs> argues that the proliferation of guns protects the citizens. Right, that, that's what they're now arguing. Now. What I'm, I was going to say, what I'm expecting, right. I haven't seen it, and I can spend Saturday watching it, I can assure you, I'm trying to avoid it, if anything. But uh, I would expect the argument to now made that if more citizens were armed, exactly. or packing, as I believe they call it in Arizona, uh, that somebody would have stopped him right. before he did as much damage as he did. So I think in terms of the, of the outcome of this for the gun control issue, it's far from clear right. that the issue exactly. will focus on you know, a lunatic who can walk into sports when a warehouse or whatever it was called and walk out with right. it. Uh, already they're making that argument. In the um, Arizona legislature, there's a debate over whether you, uh, you can allow guns, uh, professor students on campus, etc. And I, I think if that's passed, I'm not going to go to Arizona. I don't mind any of you critiquing me that I don't want to be by a gun. But in terms of uh, Gerdner, Gross, uh, et al., I mean, that continues to be relevant. I mean, Michael Moore and Columbine, the media promotes fear. Uh, they uh, just makes people afraid. And so they support gun laws and right-wing law and order uh, politicians. So that's still part of the same situation. It's just more contested now with respect to this. Um, to kind of build up both Larry and Sasha's points a little bit, um, immediately in the aftermath, uh, this participatory aspect of the spectacle took on an interesting form because people were making fake Twitters and fake uh, Facebook pages saying that they had been witnesses and that people shot back, right. um, which didn't didn't happen. And there was the immediate spread of sort of grassroots misinformation <laughs> as much as, as information. And so I'm somewhat curious towards that end, how you, if you see 
the contestation in whatever form it may take as happening in the language and content of, or form Absolutely. of spectacle, or if you see it as the contestation needing to take a different form, something like rational discourse or right. something else, and what are the potentials for um, counter-hegemonic spectacle? Certainly language is right at the heart of it. And there's been actually some very good articles that have been written about political discourse and how it's gotten so extremist and overheated and vitriolic, uh, et cetera. But also images like the Sarah Palin, you know, reloading the gun sight, uh, et cetera. And the spectacle itself. You know, so at once we have to analyze language and oppose, you know, certain discourses on in a rational, discursive uh, of way, but we also like on masculinity. We need alternative images and you know forms of behavior. Uh, in terms of media, we need alternative you know movies and TV and all kinds of uh, things. So the contestation takes place on all different levels of language, image, media, um, etc. I, I I think the idea of lobbying for different notions of masculinity. Well, it may be academically provocative, mm -hmm. is not likely to make any real progress. I'm curious why you choose that instead of lobbying for issues like, uh, I think the gun control is a good one, but right. but issues like how the, the conduct of politics is it oh, occurs, yeah. or issues even like involuntary commitment, which, you know, is very difficult to get someone with mental illness uh, treated when they're adult now. And those seem to be policy places where you could push and more likely achieve some impact. Well, the, these are absolutely gigantic uh, issues. And I talked about the importance of analyzing the political context, which is involved in that situation. In my guise and guns of mock, I do go into quite a, a bit of detail into the mental health uh, issue and that universities and just in the society at large, we really don't have to know how to deal with this. I saw somewhere, I think it might even have been Bill Clinton, who was talking about how uh, at once upon a time, uh, if someone had mental problems, they, they got care and you know were taken care of, and there were places where they could go and uh, um, be uh, taken care of. And those have just closed down now. So this, these are gigantic issues. Actually, let me just say one or two words about my uh, meta theory, which is that of media cultural uh, studies. So I think we have many things to do. Uh, we need to analyze how the media process these events. I do cultural studies, so the images of class, gender, race, sexuality is part of the analysis that I do. But I'm also very into the policy and the practice. Just uh, for the sake of this 30-minute talk today, didn't get into. But I'm glad you brought it up because these are enormous and important. Well, maybe that's what I was asking about, what I was going to ask about, which is specifically news media. Um, how do you look at its uh, kind of responsibility, accountability, agency in this? I mean, you've talked about media as something which is an amorphous, out there thing right. that is sort of subject to different whims, but I mean, do you believe it's editors or news moguls or corporate owners? I mean, is this just happenstance? Is there it's a plan? Incredibly, it's incredibly complicated. Let me answer this by saying the key issue here is accountability and responsibility. That everyone is responsible and accountable for their words, images, et cetera. Sarah Palin is, I am, um, Keith Olbermann is, NBC News, all the news networks. And the production of news as well as entertainment, is uh, a very complex uh, issue. I was discussing with one of Horace Dickens' uh, friends, television production, whether the TV producer is now the key person, or is it the writer, or actors, <coughs> or editors, etc. And the same thing you could say about uh, film. Uh, in some cases, like the Sylvester Stallone movie, you can see who's accountable and responsible. He was writer, director, uh, star. But sometimes it's impossible to um, find out who, what people are accountable, but institutions are accountable. NPR got in a lot of trouble, you know, firing uh, Juan uh, Williams. So that there, there's really, I think, um, 
increased focus on media discourse and holding people accountable, although uh, sometimes the response is problematic. I would say, uh, uh, let's see, two hands here. My question is about can you find truth within the media spectacle? I mean, I, I returned from Afghanistan in the winter of 2002, okay. and when I got back, the first class I took as a university student was a Middle Eastern politics class. Right. And I was discouraged when I would hear the students kind of perpetuate what the media was saying, but didn't reflect the truth that I knew from being on the ground. Right. And it seems like it's easier for everybody to just kind of feed into the media spectacle. And then as we moved into Iraq, I noticed that the new media spectacle quickly erased the other one because it wasn't the sexy war right. to talk about anymore. So, I mean, can you kind of talk about, is, is there hope, is there truth within the media spectacle today? And how can we use it to our advantage to keep our eye on the ball on the, on the things that we need to? Okay. Actually, my PhD is in philosophy. So I believe in truth, <laughs> uh, but I believe in it as a normative ideal that you may never attain. But basically, you get the truth through the clash of different uh, points of uh, view. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Bill Gibson, wrote a book called The Perfect War about Vietnam. And he went to what he called the warrior's knowledge of interviewing you know, soldiers and reading the diaries or you know whatever books that uh, people on the ground uh, wrote, and then looking at documentary films, looking at the media, etc. So this is this is basically the way you try to get the truth about something about Iraq and Afghanistan. In my book, uh, Cinema Wars, I saw literally every documentary about Iraq and um, about Afghanistan, etc. And I think if you look at all of these, you get if not the truth, you get you know pretty good understanding of what's going on over there, and, and read the books and the accounts from the uh, soldiers. Uh, and everyone's going to have their own truth. I mean, your experiences may be very different than someone else in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq. So all perspectives are partial, et cetera, which is why I argue for a multiplicity of perspectives to try to get as sound knowledge and insight as you can uh, get. But there's, there's no such thing as absolute truth. In this sense, I'm a doing that there's you know, no certainty. It's always contested. It's always shifted and changed. And as you get different facts, different voices, different arguments. Let's see. Um, I'm interested in uh, the, the idea of demand. Because in some ways, the truth here, uh, there's not a lot of facts. Uh, and I don't necessarily expect there to be a ton of facts coming out. I, I'm, I'm more interested in the fact this is being retold so many times. Right. And I've talked with, this goes to Sasha's point about the fact that it's now a distributed thing where a lot of this, the demand and supply is coming from, from individuals. And I've talked with a number of people who are just kind of obsessed with the, the idea that this happened. Right. And, I, and, so I, and you've talked a little about how this has an, uh, this might influence people who are responsible for these acts. Right. But can, can you talk a little about, or have you thought much about the kind of need for us as a society to reflect on what are our values? <coughs> Why is this so important to us as a moment? Is it because we need to talk about Arizona? Is it because we need to talk about the values of our politicians? All, all of the above. I mean, these are great comments that are coming out of book. You know, we need to focus on so many different things that hopefully events like this lead to soul searching and discussion about basic values, uh, things like mental health to students in uh, universities, things like gun laws, things like masculinity in the media, values of politicians. One thing that I was struck with coming out, uh, the, the congresswoman was shot, Gabriella Giffords. The descriptions of her are given sort of an ideal of what a politician should be. So I, I think you're having a lot of positive you know, discourse out uh, there, et cetera. But then, again, you're getting so much. And I, I think you started off by mentioning you're struck by the quantity of different views and the overload, et cetera. This, by the way, is a big problem of media overload and noise and information. We get so much information. Uh, we get so overloaded uh, with it that some people just, you know, tune out of these issues because, um, you know, it's just too much. It's confusing, it's depressing, it's overwhelming, etc. This is one of the reasons why I argue for 
the need to reconstruct education and teaching media and information literacy to the public, that everyone needs to know uh, what are the reliable media sources you know, to get information, what are problematic uh, sources, to be able to decode texts in terms of gender, race, class, sexuality, ideologies, values, messages, etc. So that everyone becomes a conscious and critical consumer and user of media and not just spouting off which whatever they you know see from Fox News or MSNBC or you know whatever their uh, site uh, is. So I, I think that these are teachable moments. I mean they bring a lot of issues you know up that we, we can debate and uh, discuss. Uh, if as we're doing today we have a discussion and not just people being up and yelling and yeah this will be the last question. Okay. Um, I appreciated your critique of DeBoer and the uh, situationists as having a kind of totalizing view of spectacle as uh, you know, totalistic and sort of having that opiate effect. And also your discussion of the perspective that you're taking as sort of more, less totalistic, more expansive, with multi perspectives and so on. Um, I, I always wondered about the DeBoer, but it's like, what? What's the point of resistance if, 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 if the spectacle is as totalistic as, as, as he and the situation is playing? So my question is, of the different spectacles that you've studied, which of them seem to have unfolded in ways or where, where they're, they're show possibilities of resistance uh, and uh, give a good example of the way audiences can uh, take an alternate perspective and, and refuse to that totalization? Iraq. Iraq was presented as the triumph, you know, of the Bush administration. This was a big victory, you know, with the taking down of Saddam Hussein's uh, statue. Then Bush, you know, he flies onto that carrier in, uh, outside of San Diego, mission accomplished, that sort of thing. And the anti-war movement, you know, continued to contest that, as did bloggers, you know, Keith Olbermann, certain people in the uh, media. So here's an issue that was, uh, at first, you know, it was overwhelmingly hegemonic. You know, this was a good war, it was a good victory, it was a big victory. And then, you know, this was contested, uh, I think, uh, effectively, so that by the 2008, you know, election, it had become a deficit to have, you know, defended uh, the Iraq war, and for Obama, it was, you know, a plus. So, that, so that, that's uh, an example. Um, a more ambiguous based spectacles are 9-11. And uh, they just create all kinds of problematic effects. And it could be this Arizona is going to be the same sort of thing, that somehow the gun people will win you know, the argument as they have you know, a couple of, um, elections. On the other hand, you know, this may promote soul searching and some positive uh, results. Uh, in that way. Yeah. Um, let me just, on the announcement front, next week uh, we are not meeting, it's Martin Luther King Day. The week after we're not meeting because this room has been preempted by a, another, a function from the other body. <laughs> but we, we will be meeting again uh, on January 31st, uh, John Gaskell from the University of Washington will be speaking on Connecting Small Group Deliberation with Electoral Politics, an assessment of the 2010 Oregon Citizens Initiative, may be relevant. So this discussion and the week after that will be Ann Balsamo. Uh, and we have a, we have a full schedule. And Professor Kellner will be uh, available to meet with students at 2 o'clock in this room, if you all those are you can come back. And join me in thanking Professor Kellner for taking time out of the could have written